Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In our series, we take a game, we show you how it's played, and then over the following episodes, we play the game. And where possible, put a seat at the table just for you so you can play along with us and help us make some of the gameplay decisions between the episodes. By doing this, we believe that you'll be able to decide for yourself whether or not the game would be a good fit for you, your family, or your gaming group. Now in this series, we're going to be playing the two-player game by Catalyst Game Labs, The Duke. Here, opponents will face one another across a gridded board, trying to be the first to capture their opponent's duke and be declared the winner. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. The game comes with a variety of tiles which represent each player's troops. A light colored set for one player and a dark colored set for the other. There are some additional tiles, like this special character, the dragon, terrain, like the mountain, and these two flag objectives that can be used in variant styles of play. There are even blank tiles, like these, so you can create your own custom troops using the included sticker sheets. But for our first game, let's remove the blank tiles, the flags, Mountain and Dragon. These are not required to play the standard game, but they can be added in for an additional challenge or just to add variety to your game play. There are also some special tiles with enhanced abilities. You can recognize them from their double-lined border around the outside edge. You may choose to play your first game without these as they add some additional rules, but we're feeling brave today and we'll keep them in play, explaining their special abilities a little later. It's easy to identify the different troops because their names are indicated here, and for some added flavor, they also have a special symbol to represent them. This area of the tile indicates how this piece will move during game play, which we'll examine more closely very soon. To start, each player will claim a color, light or dark, taking the associated tiles and a bag. Each player should then set aside a duke and two footmen placing all their remaining tiles into their own bag. Opponents should sit across from each other with a game board between them, and then pick a player to go first. That player will then place their duke on one of the two central spaces along their edge of the board. For example, they might place their duke right here. It's important to note that each troop has two sides, and tiles are always placed on the board with their starting side face up. Within the grid on the tile, there is a pawn symbol representing the troop itself. The side showing the black pawn is the starting side, and the side that shows the inverted white pawn is the non-starting side. So as you can see, we place the duke with the correct side face up. Now, each footman tile is placed so that one of its sides is fully adjacent to its duke. This means you would not be able to place the footman diagonally adjacent like so. But we could place this one here or over here. The second player now does the same thing, picking one of their two central spaces along their edge of the board to place their duke and also positioning their footmen in any of the directly adjacent spaces, perhaps like so. But of course, ensuring that the tiles are placed with the starting side face up. You should also notice that the tiles are always placed so that their names are oriented toward their controlling player. Gameplay now consists of one player taking a turn and then their opponent, and back and forth it goes until finally one of the players captures their opponent's duke and claims the victory. So on your turn, you're going to be taking one of three available actions, and then your turn ends. So what are the actions? Well, the first one is you may move one of the tiles that you currently control on the game board. Or you can draw a new tile randomly from your bag and place it onto the game board. And finally, if you have in play one of those double bordered tiles, you can choose to use its enhanced ability. So let's go back to the table here and see how this works. Gameplay begins with the first player taking a turn. Let's say the player chooses to do a move action. Remember, this means they'll move one tile and then their turn ends. Each type of troop has its own unique movement and you don't need to memorize it because it's shown right here on the tile itself. The pawn symbol represents the tile's current position, regardless of where it actually is on the board. 
and then the other symbols show you how this tile moves or interacts with the other spaces around it relative to its current position. For now though, let's ignore the starting setup and I'll place the tiles as I want to illustrate how they move. Take a look at the footman as an example. The solid black circles simply mean you can move to this space. So right now the footman could move one space forward or one space backwards, one space to the right or one space to the left. But keep in mind you can't move on top of one of your own pieces, so we, we can't move to the left. And you can't move off the board, so we can't move to the right or backwards. Which means if we do want to move the footman, we're actually only going to be able to move it one space forward. So let's do that. After you move a tile, you then flip it over. And this is where things get interesting. Because you can see now, the footman's movement options have changed. The next time this piece is moved, it may now be placed in one of five different options. Any one space diagonally or two spaces forward. This two spaces forward means the footman must move forward two spaces. It can't simply move one space forward and then stop. Also, if there is a friendly or enemy tile in between you and the space you're trying to move to, then you won't be able to move there. This footman would be in the way. That means that currently, this footman would only be able to move to this space here because all the other options are blocked. But let's get this footman out of the way because you are allowed to move onto an enemy tile. And you'll usually want to because when you do, you've captured that tile and it is removed from the board and placed to the side. This tile is now considered out of play. For another example of movement, let's take a look at the champion tile. Along with the regular move icons, which allow it to move forward, backwards, right or left, one space, just like the footman, it also has these empty or hollow circles. These are jumps. This allows the champion to jump to these spaces ignoring any other tiles, friendly or enemy, that may be between it and its target space. So let's say the champion wanted to jump forward. This allows the champion to ignore the duke, and nothing happens to the tile that is jumped over. But again, if you land into a space with an enemy tile, that tile becomes captured and is removed from the game. And as always, after you move a tile, flip it over to the other side. And what do we have here? On this side, the champion still has its jump options, but these stars represent strikes. The ability for a piece to capture other pieces without having to move. For example, the champion could strike this footman here, which causes the footman to be captured, but the champion itself hasn't physically moved. That said, a strike still counts as a move, so be sure to flip the tile over after you've activated that strike. As another example, look at this Dragoon Troop. It can strike at quite a distance. Now let's look at another movement symbol found here on the Duke, the solid black triangle. This is a slide movement, meaning the piece can move any distance in that direction as long as it has a clear path. For example, the Duke would have to stop at the edges or when it comes upon a friendly tile. But if this tile hadn't been here, the Duke could have slid and landed on top of this footman, capturing it and removing it from play. And, as I'm sure you're all catching on to by now, after you finish movement, you flip the tile over. The empty triangle, as found on the assassin tile, represents a jump slide. This means the piece must first jump one space in the chosen direction, and then it may continue following the rules for a regular slide. Keep in mind though, that first jump is mandatory, so the assassin would not be able to simply slide onto the general and capture it. Its first move must be that jump. But this does make him very effective for getting out of a tight space and then going immediately for the attack. Okay, the final symbol we need to learn is the command symbol, shown here on the general. It's these spaces that have the darkened in corners. In fact, along with these spaces where the general can move, you'll notice the corners are darkened in. So this is both a regular move space and a command space. This allows the general to move other tiles instead of moving itself. Any friendly tile found within one of the command spaces 
may then be moved to any other command space, and nothing blocks that movement. So this tile could go from here all the way over to here, and this enemy tile doesn't get in the way. Of course, the wiser move would probably be to move this footman on top of this footman and capture it. Now the moved tile doesn't flip because it was the general that was using its command spaces. So the general instead flips. And that's all the rules for movement. Now there are going to be some expansions released with new tiles and new movement symbols on them. And those symbols are also covered in the rules that come with the base game, but we're gonna keep things simple for now. If you think you might have some trouble remembering what these different symbols mean, including those expansion symbols, they come on this reference sheet that's included with the base game. And this is just something you can keep at the table if you think you might have some difficulty remembering what some of the different symbols mean. Okay, now instead of performing a movement with a single tile, you could instead draw a single random tile, don't look in the bag, and then place that on the game board. Your new tile must of course be placed starting side up, but also in an empty space fully adjacent to your duke. So we could place the pikeman here. But if the duke had been fully surrounded and there were no empty spaces, let's say this enemy footman had been here, then we would not be able to draw a new tile and place it. Because you're not allowed to place a new tile, even if that would mean capturing a piece. You can't capture when the new piece is being placed. Also, if you draw a new tile, you must place it on the board, even if that means it could be captured on the very next turn. And if your bag is ever completely empty, then you're not allowed to draw a new tile. Instead, you're going to have to work with the tiles that you still have left alive on the board. Now, aside from moving or drawing new tiles, if you have a tile currently in play that has enhanced abilities, you can instead choose to use one of those enhanced abilities for your turn. A tile with an enhanced ability will have a Roman numeral located right here to tell you what kind of ability it is. The Duchess has a number one, and this is the Summon ability, which when activated causes your Duke tile to flip over. And then the tile with the Summon ability can be moved to any freely available, directly adjacent space to your Duke. So that means I could not move the Duchess here to capture this footman. You're not allowed to capture, but I could move the Duchess here or right here. The nice thing about using the summoning ability right here is by flipping my Duke, it can now directly threaten this footman. And my Duchess has command abilities here, which would allow me to also move my Duke if I wanted to do so. Perhaps get it out of the way and jump it over to this position on a future turn. If your troop has the Roman numeral two, then it has the divination enhanced ability. But this ability can only be activated if the tile is on the non-starting side. And as you can see, the Oracle doesn't have any movement options when it's on this side, so this is a good time to use divination. The very first step of divination is flipping the tile over to its starting side. Then you draw three random tiles from your bag. You pick one of them to keep and place following the normal rules. So you'd need to place the tile in an empty space fully adjacent to your duke. So maybe I would place the bowman here since it has the jump ability and could threaten and capture this footman on a future turn. The other two tiles that aren't chosen can then be returned to your bag or you can choose to destroy them. This means simply don't put them in the bag, instead place them to the side of the game board. One reason to discard your own troops might be because you view them as weaker and you want to have a better chance of drawing one of your stronger tiles the next time you go into your bag. There are other enhanced abilities explained in the rule book, but these are the abilities that come with the base game. The other abilities will come with tiles as part of expansions. And once again, if you think you're going to have trouble remembering any of these rules, that reference card I showed you before, flip it over. On the back side, these enhanced abilities, including those that are coming with the expansions, are listed right here. So keep it by the table, and that will certainly help out. Now there's just a couple more things to go over before we wrap up. It's possible, if you're not careful, 
you'll end up with a stuck tile. This is a tile that has no way to move. Like our poor Duke here. Can't slide backwards, it would go off the board. And it can't slide forward because there's a friendly tile in the way. Thankfully, this footman here can move backwards diagonally and capture this footman, not only removing the threat, but also freeing the Duke up to move on a future turn. So a part of good gameplay is ensuring your tiles don't get stuck, especially when they're in a vulnerable position. Now another rule is that you are allowed to examine the underside of any tile that you control. Maybe you need a reminder about what its movement actions are. Now that said, unless you and your opponent agreed to it at the beginning of the game, you should never pick up one of your opponent's tiles to see what it can do. Finally, anytime you place or move a tile such that on its next turn it would be able to capture an opponent's duke, you must say out loud, guard. This is a reminder to your opponent that they're in trouble. Also, a player cannot move one of their own tiles if it would willfully put their duke in danger of being captured by an opponent's tile on the next turn. If you can force your opponent into a position where their duke cannot be saved and you are able to capture it during your turn, you win the game. And that's how you play a standard game of the duke. But the rulebook also covers other variable ways you can play. Remember I showed you this tile earlier, the mountain. Very briefly, this is a tile the players can agree to randomly place on the board. This is a six by six grid, so you could roll two six-sided dice, one to represent the horizontal position and one to represent the vertical position. Once placed, the mountain tile now blocks movement through it, including jumping over it. New tiles can't be placed on it. It blocks strikes through it and so on. The dragon is an optional tile that is placed at the start of the game in one of the central four spaces. It's oriented on its side to show its neutrality. It's after both of the players. Essentially, between each player's turns, if the dragon could move to capture one of the tiles, it will do so. Now there are additional rules for the dragon, as well as for other tiles, like these flags that I mentioned earlier. And they're covered, of course, in the rulebook. But again, they included another reference sheet just for these special tiles. And on the other side, we have a diagram explanation for each of the movement symbols that we talked about earlier. And these are on a nice, glossy, thick cardstock. Now, I don't review games on my series, you know that. But I do have to say, these are a great idea. Publishers, you really should do this. And Catalyst Game Labs, good job. I really appreciate this. As someone who usually has to teach the games, this gives me everything I need to know on a couple of sheets. It's fantastic. Okay, so that's all I want to explain to you about the actual gameplay. In the rules, you are going to find other variable ways to play. Instead of capturing the Duke, they set up objectives like capturing the flags. There's even a drafting style so you can build your own unique army in your bag and your opponent will be bringing their own unique army. But I'm going to leave that for you to discover on your own if you decide this is a game that you want to pick up. If you have any questions at all about the gameplay though, please don't hesitate to ask them in the comments below and I'll answer as soon as I'm able. I love getting your feedback. And in the next episode, Luke is going to join me and we're actually going to play through a full game of the Duke so you can really see how all of this comes together. I hope you'll join us. But until then, thanks for watching.